Good afternoon. Welcome to Telescience Museum's Mineral Symposium. This is our first day of a five-day event. In past years, we've had it as a Saturday event in person, but with the global situation, we're doing everything online, and today it is my pleasure to welcome Christopher Clark as our speaker. Um, tomorrow, come back at the same time, and we will have Jose Santa Maria, the Executive Director of Telescience Museum, um, presenting on um, caring for your collection, but today we have the question of what to collect. And Christopher Clark, who is the um, the expert on gems at um, JTV, is going to tell us kind of how we might want to gauge our own collections and what areas might interest us in the collecting world. Christopher, over to you. Hello. Well, uh, welcome to uh, the uh, the Science uh, Museum uh, Tele Symposium here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, trying to figure out what it is that you would like to collect. When uh, I first started out uh, younger, you know, I've been a collector all my life. Uh, started off with Transformers as a kid, baseball cards, comic books, and when I got older, um, I got uh, into collecting metals, uh, mainly silver. Um, that led me on to jewelry. Jewelry led me to JTV, Gemstones uh, was a big interest as soon as I got there. And then later on, uh, I worked on a book project where we were showing minerals, gems, and jewelry and just got uh, sucked into uh, to minerals big time then. So I've, uh, I've collected a little bit of everything over the years. And of course, the challenge is, you know, when you first start, you just want to buy anything that gets your interest. And uh, had to kind of start directing my, my purchasing and my collecting after a while, although I must say that my own personal collection is a collection of collection. So uh, when you look at my displays, typically they're little, little kind of Um, so uh, you can collect just for the challenge of, of uh, getting that one hard to uh, find mineral specimen or as wide a variety as you can find of something. Uh, there are competitions uh, that you can enter your collected pieces in. Uh, there are competitions for specimens and uh, things that you've self-collected or just if uh, you, know, you want to find the most perfect of a particular variety. Collecting these things can give you a connection to the larger world. Uh, you know, I'd never really, you know, had much of a of inkling to travel to some of the places that I would now love to go to just because of the mineral specimens and what I've heard about the people and the mines in those areas now. Of course, there's going to be a great amount of education that you can get from collecting. Um, anytime you're, you're finding a new specimen, if you're like me, you're hitting Google, you're hitting Mendat, you're trying to find as much as you can about it. Um, some people collect to uh, just, you know, store wealth. Uh, there are quite valuable specimens, and uh, some people like to, uh, to do it for more financial reasons. Uh, of course, personal enjoyment should be in there somewhere, no matter how you're doing it. Um, philanthropy, recognition, um, interest with others, uh, all of these things can be just great reasons to collect. Now, once you have a collection, what are you going to do with it? 
Uh, some people are completionists, and depending on what it is you decide to collect, that can be pretty challenging. Uh, there are some things that you know are very limited that it would be fairly easy to complete a collection on. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to do a, a red barrel collection, it's probably going to be pretty easy and a short list of what you need to get. But if you're going for you know every quartz locality in the world, then you're going to be at it for a while. Um, you know, some people just like uh, to have it displayed in their home. Some people will like to put together pieces for a museum view. Uh, eventually, you might want to donate it to uh, have a little bit of a legacy. You can donate it to a museum or a university, you know, for education. And, you know, some people sell. Had uh, one collector that we got some beautiful pieces from for our internal collection here at Jewelry Television, who was a barrel collector for a while put together a very nice uh, collection of a wide variety of types and localities of barrels, brought them to us to sell them because he was done. He had completed his uh, collection, he had enjoyed it for as long as he wanted to, and he was going to move on to Tourmaline, so we added it to ours. And then, uh, of course, with that, a big thing that you really should think about and think about on the front end is what's your budget. Uh, one thing I learned very early on is always buy the best that you can afford. Um, I have some really nice little thumbnail specimens that I bought early on when my budget for a show was like maybe a hundred dollars. And I found someone who put together really, really aesthetic and high quality uh, thumbnails and miniatures at a very affordable price. And because the quality of those is so good, I still enjoy them alongside my, my much more expensive specimens. They're, they're still just as good a quality, just you know, different size-wise. Um, having those funds available uh, you know, on a budget, basically knowing what it is you're going to spend before you go online, before you go to a show, is really important so you know exactly you know, how much you're going to buy and, and you don't have so much of a hesitation. Uh, doing your research beforehand to figure out how much uh, you know expecting you're gonna get some sticker shock in the mineral world I can tell you that I still do on some things it blows my mind but uh, sometimes it, it goes the other direction too and something winds up being way more affordable than I had assumed it was going to be and I hadn't planned on getting it until I actually saw it at a show so doing your research ahead of time will will pay dividends uh, for, for when you're going out to uh, purchase pieces um, Trying to budget for what uh, your completing collection or where you want to go helps immensely uh, with uh, being able to pull the trigger when you find something. One of the really important things about planning your collection or deciding what you want to collection in my head of all of the pieces that have gotten away. Uh, in some situations, uh, there was uh, the last Tucson show I went to. Um, got a collection of really nice uh, multicolored zoazites. I found a bubblegum pink piece. I wanted to pay cash for it, uh, see if I could get a little bit better of a deal, and walked away to go get cash, came back 20 minutes later, and it was gone. Uh, I've had that happen on several occasions that I looked at a piece, hadn't made up my mind. Five minutes later, I was like, I really do need to get that, and even that was too late. So having an idea of where you want your collection to go, and how much you want to spend on it will help you make those decisions at a show and uh, build your collection to its best. So, what do you want to collect? So here I'm going to talk about uh, different ways to collect gemstones, specimens, and jewelry. Of course, for me, I started off with jewelry, went to gemstones, and ended up uh, being more of a specimen collector. So, gemstones. Uh, gemstones are mostly graded on the four C's, cut, color, clarity, and carat. Uh, carat uh, weight basically uh, being one uh, 20th of a gram, so uh, much smaller than uh, specimens, which can be you know, hand-sized in most cases. So, uh, if you're going to collect with uh, carat being a focus, there are many uh, gemstones that are... Uh, prevalent in various sizes. Not all gemstones are, are going to occur in a wide variety of ranges or a wide variety of sizes. Uh, this little guy right here, uh, midway down the list, is a hoin. Uh, hoin is uh, very small, uh, typically, and faceted stones average around 10 to 25 uh, points, or 10.10 to a quarter of a carat in size. This hoin that I'm showing here, that, that is not a large wooden spoon or the end of an ore that it's next to. That is a sunflower seed, <laughs> to give you an idea of the scale there. 
um, Alexandrites, you can get them over a carrot, but they become extraordinarily expensive and fine quality over a carrot. Uh, Grandidiorite, uh, that's a relatively newer one to find in fine quality. And uh, most of the fine quality pieces that I've found uh, that have been you know, more affordable are, again, at that quarter carat and under range. And they get very, very uh, a sharp climb in the price of the carrot once you get over that. Uh, palisadic peridot. Uh, this is peridot that's been recovered from a meteorite. And a lot of it, uh, because of the impact, you know, in its nature, has the little micro fractures going through it. And it's just not prone to cutting large gems. Uh, the largest one that I think I've seen, I want to say, was about two carats, and that was a five-figure stone. But uh, you can get uh, some nice uh, pieces in, you know, a little bit under a quarter carat. Uh, they're pretty affordable. And, of course, Red Barrel, another one that you can see larger stones uh, over a carat or two, but uh, very, very expensive at no size, if you, sizes. If you're looking to collect those uh, just, you know, casually, probably quarter carat and under is what you're looking at there. Now, a lot of gems are going to be very affordable at over a carat in a wide variety of qualities. You know, emerald, ruby, and sapphire, uh, those are easily going to be found in a variety of qualities at a carat plus. Uh, faceted labradorites uh, or uh, even the phenomenal labradorites can be quite large. Uh, opals of all varieties, peridot, spinel, tanzanite, all of those are easy to find in those sizes. So, uh, you know, some people like the large ones. There's uh, some very large uh, gemstones that they call are in the 100 carat club or the 100 plus carats. And uh, you can find those, uh, some, you know, like quartz uh, are going to be very affordable, even in the very large sizes. Uh, ambers as well. Some fluorites uh, can be uh, pretty, uh, pretty affordable in large sizes. When you get into aquamarines, uh, the barrels, green barrel, heliodor, morinite, those can get pretty pricey in the large sizes, but you can get, you know, two or three hundred carat stones are out there. And uh, topaz, uh, you can, you know, find some giant topazes. So, you know, you might want to build your, your gemstone uh, collection to, to, you know, be of a, you know, smaller, medium, or large size. Anything will fit uh, or anything is possible. Um so with the size, you know, you might choose to go with uniformity. Uh, you have uh, a nice little suite of uh, Benita Whites there uh, showing the variety in color, but they're all cut to uh, a calibrated size. Uh, the Dan Brights on the right side are a graduated size done as a, a suite to uh, display aesthetically or to make into a jewelry piece later on. Um, you might go with a, a variety of sizes or just, you know, pieces that are unusual sizes for their their varieties you know if you find that that you know two carat queen that's just like crazy rare for its size um, the bottom picture there to give you an idea of large sizes is uh sphalerite so the big orange one is about 257 carats uh the green one is about half that size and for comparison the uh clear gem on the bottom right is a one carat diamond <laughs> give you some idea as to how big those guys are so uh, clarity is another way. Um, so gemstones are typically done as type one, two, or three uh, in regards to their clarity. With the type one gems, they're expected to be eye clean. The type two, you're gonna see a little bit of something there. Uh, so uh, you know, eye clean uh, will be at a premium price. And then uh, type three, actually, it looks like I, I forgot one of my eyes there. Uh, type three. Those, uh, like the bottom, uh, the emerald on the bottom left, those you're expecting there to be definitely noticeable uh, inclusions in the average gemstone of that type, like Colombian emerald. Uh, of course, when you get iron loop clean stones, those are going to be much, much higher because they're much more rare. And then, uh, of course, your translucent opaque stones generally uh, don't uh, concern themselves with clarity. Um, so interesting things with clarity is, uh, you know, you can go whichever way you want, depending on how much you want to spend. So emeralds, rubies, um, sapphires, so more or ruby and sapphire, for example, you can find those with uh, type two clarity. But if you want to collect those particular varieties on a budget, uh, you can go for the more opaque stones with lower clarity and buy them very, very reasonably. Uh, on the opposite direction, if you go for things like rubellite, tourmaline, and uh, emerald that 
are just absolutely loop or eye clean, you're going to pay a premium price, but you're going to have some really rare gemstones. While the gemstone variety itself isn't extremely rare, the very high quality of it is. Um, and then, of course, another one that you can do is uh, like Grand Diddy, right? For the longest time, uh, what we were seeing was this opaque material, but now there's this clean faceted material. So all of a sudden there's something new and exciting to collect in a uh, clarity that we hadn't seen before. And then one of my favorites is collecting gemstones with interesting inclusions. Uh, the picture that we're looking at right here is a diamond that we sold back in about 2008. I want to say it was about a 1.87 carat uh, fancy brown diamond. And when I looped it, I noticed this little inclusion you can see at the bottom. Uh, you can really see, it's a horse's head. Uh, so you can see the nose, the mouth, you can see the bridle, the eyes, the mane, the jawline, the ears, and everything. And uh, collecting for very unusual inclusions can be a really exciting collection. Uh, I've got a couple myself. I've got a, a nice little diamond that right off of the center has a inclusion in the shape of a heart. Uh, and then, you know, I'm from Tennessee uh, here in Knoxville, and I've got a... Uh, very nice uh, sunstone that's got a nice uh, UT uh, uh, looking inclusion in it. Although a friend of mine from Vermont said, no, it's Vermont, not UT. So uh, with collecting gemstones, often color is king. Uh, if you're collecting colored gemstones, going for the, uh, the best saturation you can or uh, unusual colors is uh, usually the way to go. Uh, you can get gemstones that are single color if you just want uh, more, you know, uh, orderly uh, single color collection. Me, I love all the colors. So, so for me, things like opal, fire agate, uh, rainbow, androdite garnet, uh, uh, iris quartzes, uh, things like that that show me just the wide spectrum of colors at once are my absolute favorites. And I have more of that type of gem than just about any other. Uh, bicolor gems uh, can be a very, very attractive uh, to collect. With bicolor gems, you're usually looking for gems that have uh, as close to a 50-50 split uh, as you can get to. Uh, and of course, a, a, the more or the greater difference in contrast between the colors, typically the more desirable and uh, collectible a stone is. And then there's color zoning. Here we have an Oregon sunstone and just absolutely beautiful uh, Schiller. Uh, and uh, red and orange and green color zoning going all through this stone, just adding to the beauty of it. Um, some stones you can have more symmetrically zoned. Uh, some are more, you know, scattered like this, but they can all uh, be really, really fun to, uh, to show. And then there's uh, gemstones with pleochroic colors. Uh, this is a, a tan tonight, and you can see the, uh, you see the nice blue, little hint of purple, some of the green going on through here. Um, you have other gems like uh, Andalusite or Iolite uh, that have very, very uh, noticeable pleochorism. And the fun thing about collecting and displaying those stones is uh, the pleochoric colors are visible as you view the stone in different directions. So when you have them on display or in hand, you can walk around or, or roll that stone around in your hand, and you're going to see multiple colors in the same gemstone. A lot of fun. Uh, color suites or sets. This is actually one that I really enjoy. Uh, you're looking at three different colors of sapphire. Of course, typically when we talk about sapphire, we mean blue, but uh, there are uh, other colors. Of course, with corundum, if it's red, it's going to be ruby, but every other color than blue is typically fancy yellow, fancy violet, or you know, just has its color name attached to it. So with sapphire, if you wanted to collect every color of the rainbow, in sapphire corundum, you can absolutely do that. Um, my personal taste is zoazite. I've been going for uh, bubblegum pinks, oranges, purples, yellows, greens, uh, just a wide variety of colors. When, uh, you know, working here at JTV, of course, we sell more tanzanite than anything. And it was years before I realized that the zoazite actually came in colors other than blue and violet. And so had to get every color out there, and I'm still working on that. So color change. Uh, there's a lot of exciting options with color change gemstones. Uh, this is a color change uh, blue uh, garnet from uh, Africa, uh, Madagascar, I believe, on this one. Um, little pockets of those. You know, they, they're not available all the time. Uh, just, you know, they, they find them every now and then in different uh, uh, regions of Africa and uh, really, really striking gems, very similar to the color change you'd see in fine alexandrite. Uh, of course, alexandrite being the most popular of the color change gemstones, but uh, you can find uh, several different varieties that exhibit a color change. 
And then uh, we move on to cut. Uh, the, the critical C, just because this is one that a lot of people, you know, can, can really be critical on. It's the one that is uh, basically done by man. Everything else is just as it comes out of the ground. Uh, can be slightly enhanced, but uh, the cut is all down to what we ourselves do to the gym. Uh, you know, you have cabochons, you have carb gems, fa uh, faceted, fantasy cut, freeform. There's just so many options for uh, for collecting by cut. So when you're looking at cut gemstones, uh, things that are important, uh, brilliance uh, of the stone. Brilliance of the stone is how much light comes back to the eye. Um, Typically, uh, you want to uh, you know see as much color as possible. So uh, a highly brilliant stone, you're giving you lots of color on the face. Like the bottom three here is uh, is going to be where you want to go. The top one is a little dark, so not much brilliance to it there. Um, that's uh, that gemstone is showing a lot of extinction, which basically means the light's going out the bottom of the gem and not returning to the eye. Uh, you want a nice outline uh, that is a nice uniformity to the outer edge of the stone. You can see the bottom three are, are nice and symmetrical with a nice uh, outline. The top one is just a little off. There's a little waviness to the edges there. It's, it's a little slanted in one direction. Its proportions are just not very good. And um, another thing that you look for is, uh, is windowing. Windowing is uh, similar to what we're seeing here in this uh, tanzanite. Uh, basically, there's a little area where we're not really seeing any color, and we call that a window. Um, you know, these are just all things to evaluate your gemstone purchases on. But you don't want to, especially if you're looking at rare varieties, be too critical of the cut. Um, a 70% or better brilliance, which is what we're seeing in this stone here, is considered to be a very well-cut gem. So don't be scared off from the stone if it just has, you know, a little bit of a window. Um, sometimes uh, that is actually done deliberately in over-dark material. They're cut a little shallow to window it so you can get uh, some nice light in there. But if you're going for a rare gemstone variety, again, a lot of the times you're going to find what you call native cuts, which is a cut that's been done to retain as much weight as possible. And uh, you can always have the cut, uh, you know, addressed with a lapidary later on. But uh, if you're looking for rare material, you know, expect that uh, you might have to satis uh, be satisfied with the not the best cut just to get it into your collection. Um, now, if you're going to collect by cut, there's a wide variety. I uh, just have, you know, a few examples here, step cuts, uh, oval cuts, uh, carved bottom cuts, things like that. Uh, you can, you know, go with one particular way that you want to do it or mix and match. Um, carvings are a favorite of mine. Uh, this is uh, my little mascot, Rubit, uh, carved ruby and zoazite. Uh, found her actually in London, of all places, at the uh, London Silver Vaults. You know, wherever you are, it's, it's always good if you uh, find something related to gems, jewelry, and minerals. You know, look around. You'll be surprised at what you could find out there. Um, specialty cuts. Uh, these are cuts where they've done a, something beyond just the basic faceting. Here you're looking at a large morganite that has a concave cut. So the facets on the, uh, the pavilion, uh, the bottom of the gem, are all cut into the gem. They're not flat. They actually have a curve that goes in towards the center of the gem, and they give it an excellent uh, roll and quality to the light of the gem as it rolls around in your hand. Really, really pretty stone. Uh, of course, fantasy cuts uh, is kind of a catch-all uh, for just, you know, things that are outside the normal fa uh, faceting. Here we have a Brazilian root-bladed quartz that uh, the top was cut like a cabochon, just a smooth dome over the top, but uh, it was carved into the bottom to get those beautiful angular shapes, which complement the uh, rutile inclusions inside. Now, another ways or other ways that you can collect uh, gemstones, regional is a good way to go. So here we're looking at a map of garnet. You decide to collect garnet, you're looking at uh, the red pips are your pyropes, the purple are your rhodolites, the more brownish reds are almondines, and the oranges are spacertines. And this is uh, a map showing more uh, readily available sources of garnets, not just places that they have occurred. So if you're looking at occurrences of garnet, uh, you can, you know, this would go up by an order of magnitude. Um, and uh, collecting by region can be a lot of fun. Uh, that's uh, one of the collections I do on Sapphire is I try to get sapphires from as many different regions as possible. I've got some uh, French and German as well as, you know, U.S., Montana, Sri Lanka. 
uh, African. I'm looking to add a uh, Scottish uh, sapphire to my collection. I just found out recently that uh, there are Scottish sapphires, so uh, that's one I'm looking forward to adding myself. Inclusions, uh, again, uh, as we were talking earlier, can be a really fun way to collect. Of course, amber is known for having some of the most uh, interesting inclusions. You get these little fossil insects. Uh, these are uh, Hymenoptera uh, insects from uh, Dominican amber. I can just I can spend all day looking inside uh, amber under a microscope. Uh, Trapeche emeralds. Uh, and trapeches actually occur in several other varieties. You can find them in uh, quartzes. You can find them in barrels. Um, really fun to uh, collect there. And just oddities. Uh, these are one of my favorites. Uh, these are uh, alphabet uh, chalcedonies from Indonesia. Um, I've got some rough of this material, and the rough material is just has a jungle gem of these uh, inclusions going all through the stone. So somebody has to plot out the intersection of these inclusions and cut them out in a way to uh, make these alphabet sets. And uh, these are just an absolute blast. I've got uh, about three or four of these. Uh, this one's my favorite just because uh, I've, I've got some that are more thin and I guess a little more pristine. This one's just wonky. I love, uh, love every letter of the set. And then, of course, there are rarities. Uh, there are a lot of gemstones uh, that are very hard to find. You're, you're going to have a little bit of a challenge finding them online. You may not see them at a uh, show. You may have to go to a big show like uh, the Tucson show to find some of these. Uh, here we're looking at a verisite on the top left. Uh, uh, the top right is a eudialite. Uh, you see it often in uh, spheres and cabochon material, but finding it faceted is uh, a little challenging. Um, bottom left, we have Benito White, which is definitely one you can find, but uh, finding larger pieces uh, can be rather challenging financially. Uh, they get pretty expensive once they hit about half or uh, half or a carat. Uh, the nice little sweets are, are pretty available, though, and those are fun to collect. And then uh, bottom right, we have Tarfite. That's uh, one you don't see very often, and you're probably going to have to search around a little bit to, uh, to find some Tarfite for your collection. Uh, rough and cuts. Those are really fun, especially if you're a gemstone collector going to be a mineral collector or vice versa. Uh, getting gem quality rough to uh, show with a gem faceted stone or even just a, a nice mineral specimen that wouldn't be cut uh, to show with the stone can make for a really interesting display. People always love to see where things come from. Now we go on to specimens. So uh, again, I started off with uh, jewelry, went to gem stones and then into specimens and so I am probably about four or five years into being a specimen collector and of course you know knowing how to collect other things has helped me in that but there were a lot of things I had to learn because specimens uh, collecting can be a little different than uh, than your gems or your jewelry. Um, for one thing you have a huge array uh, you know just talked about the the different cuts and the four C's of collecting specimens can have a lot more going so uh, you can get combinations, uh, like this uh, top uh, piece we have here is a nice uh, uh, fluorite with aragonite. Uh, you can have floaters, which is what the uh, green spodumene on the top right is. Uh, that's where you have a completed crystal all the way around, and not just broken off of the matrix. Um, you can have uh, gem quality uh, specimens. You can have them on matrix, like the aracalcite down in the bottom uh, left there. No matrix, like the uh, petroleum and quartz on the right side. Pseudomorphs, where one uh, mineral has taken over another one, and then just a vast array of shapes and forms. And, of course, there are tons of sizes uh, to choose from. Um, combinations are one of my absolute favorite. Uh, so here uh, you're looking at uh, malachite, brokentite, uh, azurite, uh, on a matrix, and the matrix has got you know a little bit of uh, iron mineral, uh, limonite uh, type of uh, stuff going on there. We just get an incredible uh, rainbow of colors uh, with this combination of uh, specimens here, or mineral uh, varieties here on the specimen. So floaters, as I was talking about, uh, this is a uh, rainbow fluorite from Germany. Again, I love uh, I love all the colors at once. And uh, once I got this in hand, I found out that it looked like it had, you know, perhaps broken off of a larger piece at some point. But there was uh, another event that came through and recrystallized the material all the way around. So uh, this was one of the first floaters that I got. 
and I really love finding those mineral specimens where it's it's a complete crystal or there's complete crystallization in just 360 degrees. They're really fun to look at and just kind of envision, you know, what happened in the area where that formed. Uh, but uh, that's that's a subset of my collection as I have uh, different varieties of little floaters. Uh, gem quality. This can be one of the more expensive ones to collect, uh, especially because many times when you're trying to uh, collect uh, gem variety, like uh, the emerald here, if it is a very nice, uh, clean crystal, then somebody wants to cut it up and make a gemstone out of it. Uh, many other people do want to save it, but the price can be set uh, kind of based on what the, uh, the gem is worth uh, once it's cut. So it can be uh, very challenging to, uh, to keep those gem quality uh, materials intact, and uh, they can be quite pricey because of their gem value. Uh, matrix uh, specimens. Uh, I really love a nice crystal perched on uh, the matrix uh, from uh, whence it came. Uh, here we've got a Don Mine uh, fluorite from China, and you know it just has a tiny little bit of matrix on it, but it just looks uh, like it's got its best foot forward on that uh, that little piece of rock there. Uh, you can go uh, big or small with that, a little bit of matrix, or you can have very large matrix pieces. Um, more matrix isn't always better. I have some fluorites where uh, there's about a cubic foot of uh, matrix for uh, about two inches of uh, specimen there. Sometimes they need to be trimmed, uh, but uh, if, the, if there's a nice aesthetic balance uh, between uh, matrix and specimens, uh, those can make for a very, very nice collection. Uh, you might just not want the matrix and you just want the pure mineral itself. Here we have a nice uh, Elmwood fluorite. Uh, this one has that nice recrystallization going up the back uh, and it's just a uh, complete piece in and of itself. Very dramatic, nice big cube. Um, pseudomorphs. Uh, these are one that I'm actually uh, newer to. I've only really started collecting these in about the past year or two. And uh, the one in the center um, is on the bottom right there is one of the first ones I picked up. Uh, I picked this one up at Tucson uh, about, I guess it was uh, about three years ago now. And uh, this is a spinel pseudomorphed after uh, ruby from Burma. And so what that means is you had this ruby uh, grow uh, in this marble, and then later on an event occurred where Spinel, atom for atom, replaced that ruby. Uh, I've actually tested this piece, and in some places uh, it still tests as ruby, but overall it tests as Spinel. Uh, more recent acquisition just this year uh, pop, uh, popped uh, across, uh, 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 ran across it online, is uh, the exact opposite. Here we have Ruby replacing Spinel from Pakistan. And so the thing that amazes me is that this, this transition goes both ways. So I was just delighted uh, when I found this piece and that these are kind of uh, tail ends of a very long geographic region from Burma up to Pakistan and uh, just love seeing it back and forth. Uh, most recently there were some really cool uh, epido after orthoclase specimens that showed up from, I believe, New Mexico. Uh, and there's just all sorts of uh, pseudomorphs that you can find where one mineral has replaced another, and it's just really interesting to think about uh, what's going on there. Uh, collecting pseudomorphs can give you a very, very uh, variety, uh, wide variety of specimens to collect and uh, tangentially touch in on a lot of uh, other parts of your collection as a uh, you get uh, transitions of one mineral to another. So shapes and forms. Uh, as I noted earlier, one of the things that uh, got me started when I was uh, doing minerals uh, was actually collecting cut spheres. After I had been collecting spheres for a while, I started noticing that there were actually naturally spherical shaped uh, minerals. Uh, here we're looking at uh, fluorites on the top. Uh, the middle we've got a wavelite, and then on the uh, bottom we have a calcite. And uh, there's a, a pretty large variety of uh, specimens that occur in these uh, botryoidal or almost uh, spherical forms. Um, another one that's uh, really enjoyable to collect uh, that I've just started on the last uh, year or two is uh, collecting different habits and forms of quartz. Uh, quartz can grow in a, a wide variety of uh, shapes and forms, and you can make an entire collection that uh, calcite as well uh, could occupy you for many years uh, trying to get an exhaustive uh, collection of uh, 
calcite varieties and changes the forms. So uh, sizes is another way to collect specimens. Um, here you have a list uh, giving you an idea of uh, the various sizes. You'll hear this, uh, you know, listed every now and then. So I've got the uh, measurements to give you an idea of what sizes you're looking at. Um, most of my collection tends to fall within the miniature and small uh, cabinet uh, areas. I really, really like uh, as uh, fine a mineral specimen as I can get. So that pretty much constrains me for my budget, usually to the mineral and small cabinet size. Once you get into exceptionally fine mineral specimens and cabinet sizes and larger, you're looking at some very, very pricey specimens. Um, thumbnails are a great way to collect as well. Thumbnails are uh, just those little two to three uh, centimeter uh, sizes. I'm trying to see if I have any over here. But uh, you can uh, a lot of collection in a small space when you're a thumbnail collector. And the thing that's really nice about collecting thumbnails is you can get that best in the world specimen that would be $50,000 and you're only paying maybe a couple of hundred dollars or so for it in a thumbnail size. So if you really, really like the best of the best of the best quality, I would recommend looking into thumbnails as a possible route for your collection. Um, if you really want to share your collection uh, for, you know, people coming to look at it, you know, especially if you've got it in a cabinet, then the larger sizes are probably the way that you want to go. So for me, uh, one of the most important things in collecting specimens are aesthetics, uh, just that it is beautiful to look at. Uh, for the long-term value of your collection, especially if you decide to uh, maybe trade some of your collection as your tastes change, or if you're looking to resell down the road, it's hard to go wrong with an aesthetic specimen. That's going to appeal to almost anyone, even somebody who's new, or even somebody who has no interest in gems or minerals or geology, but they know BD when I see it. Can't go wrong with uh, collecting aesthetic specimens. Uh, properties. Uh, there are all sorts of different things like uh, color change and what we're seeing here, which is fluorescence uh, that occurs uh, throughout the, uh, the mineral world. Uh, really, really fun uh, way to collect. You can either you know, pick one property or just go for as many as you can see. Uh, labradorescence, iridescence, play of color, all of those occur uh, in the mineral world just like they do in gemstones. And uh, as with gemstones, color, it's not king, I would say, because I've got a lot of black and gray and colorless uh, minerals, but it's still very, very important. And one of the things that you'll find as you, uh, you collect is that uh, the uh, uh, challenge can be getting some colors in your uh, specimen collection. Uh, anytime that you're going to add vibrant colors, that's usually going to be a little bit more expensive of a specimen and uh, definitely get color in there as you can, uh, depending on, you know, the variety that you're going for. So, uh, again, uh, color is king uh, for me <laughs> in specimen collecting. I actually have a, a specific part of my collection is devoted to rainbow gemstones. And uh, what I've set as my collecting gem or my collecting uh, uh, criteria for my rainbow gemstones, it has to show at least three colors, and at least uh, one of the colors has to be warm or grays uh, uh, or green, blue, violet, and uh, at least one color has to be warm, yellow, red, or orange. And uh, so uh, I've uh, amassed uh, quite a little uh, collection of nice rainbow gemstones, and just seeing all that color on one shelf is, is a lot of fun for me. Um, Symmetry crystal forms, if you if you just really like that ordered look, uh, euhedral crystals are very, very fine uh, quality crystals that just show the classic gem shape uh, might be a good way for you to collect. Um, many, many varieties uh, that you can find these fine crystal forms are readily available, and then some others can be very, very challenging. Uh, when we were doing a uh, book, uh, uh, earlier on, I was looking for a nice uh, kyanite crystal and had a really, really hard time finding just a really fine uh, solitary kyanite crystal out there to photograph for the book. So, you know, some things can be more uh, challenging. Uh, pieces like the smoky quartz here, though, you, you can find, you know, quartz uh, crystals of uh, fine uh, shapes anytime you want, pretty much. And then there's rarities. Uh, so, here we have a, a Swiss fluorite. I was uh, tickled, pardon me, uh, pink uh, to get this little piece added to my collection. They are very rare, 
and uh, very, very pricey and larger specimens. This one is a thumbnail, but uh, I, I collect quite a bit of fluorite, and so I was thrilled to get this one to just kind of check that box. You know, I might be open to adding a larger uh, one later in my collection, but at least I know I've got my little uh, box ticked for uh, locality and, and color and rarity on, uh, on this particular little fluorite. Um, rarities, uh, this is another, you know, going back to you want to plan out your collection. With rarities, there are a lot of these pieces that uh, you won't see them very often. They occur in small pockets. Uh, they're going to go quickly. Uh, one little oddball that I got at the last Tucson show was a completely colorless uh, fluorite from the Elmwood mine in Tennessee. And uh, that one is just not something you see very often. And uh, when I went back to talk to the vendor later on, uh, she told me that someone had been stalking me the entire time I was looking around her uh, her uh, booth, waiting for me to put that colorless down because uh, they were going to pounce on it, and then asked her exhaustively if she could get another one later. So um, getting knowing how to identify those rarities and snatch them up when you stumble across them is a very important part of planning your collection. Because uh, you, like I said, you hate it when you miss them. Uh, interesting shapes. Uh, this one was one that I just picked up uh, just just because of the, uh, the the look of it. It looks floral to me. Uh, this is a uh, calcite from uh, Austria. Not a big calcite collector. Not a big uh, collector of Austrian minerals. But it was just such a neat shape that I couldn't pass up pass it up. It looks absolutely beautiful in the cabinet, and uh, everybody's eyes are just drawn to it when they come by. You know, love the aesthetic of that piece. So, uh, you know, another fun way to collect there. And uh, interesting forms. I like combinations of forms. Uh, I, I enjoy botryoidal uh, specimens, that nice uh, bubbly look. And what we have here is botryoidal fluorite uh, from uh, Namibia on top of uh, shoral. And the uh, shoral tourmaline uh, on the bottom, that black base, you can see some nice angular crystallization there. Which uh, color and the the color and the angles just con contrast completely uh, with the floor right there and make for just a really neat form. Hadn't seen that one before. Uh, I'd stumbled across that and just really loved the combination there. Um, and then aesthetic combinations. Uh, here we're looking at a uh, pink sapphire from Pakistan, marble. Um, not you know a super rare thing to find. But this particular one, particular one, just the way that it was put together uh, with that uh, sapphire just nestled in uh, that marble, and it sits upright just all on its own. Uh, snatch that one up immediately because it's just a perfect little display piece. Checks off several boxes for me, including the, the, the gem variety uh, for my collection, and uh, fits in quite well. Uh, there are many, many uh, set of combinations out there, contrast, various colors, or just uh, unusual occurrences of uh, minerals together can be quite lovely. Uh, metallics and native elements. Uh, now, if uh, you uh, really, really like your metals, you can find lots of things to collect as a, as a collector. Uh, here we're looking at uh, one of my favorite uh, minerals, ferritite. And you'll find also in collecting that potato potato has absolutely nothing on the mineral world. Uh, you, you'll hear gertite, you'll hear goethite, goeth, goethite, like many, many different pronunciations for this. There's a lot of the things that I either butcher or I've read, and I haven't actually heard anybody pronounce it the right way. So, you know, pronunciations will vary uh, from person to person that you talk to. But, you know, as long as you know what you're talking about, uh, usually uh, you can have a good conversation with somebody about it. So uh, uh, the Gertite here, that nice bubbly uh, form, uh, that botryoidal form, is a real favorite of mine. You can get some gorgeous iridescence covering some of these. Uh, there's Galena, which uh, is lead. And even though you, know, you wouldn't think lead's exciting, you can get some great cubic forms on that. And then gold, silver, and copper uh, can have some incredible, incredible crystalline forms and uh, wire shape forms that are very highly sought out and uh, collectible. See. Um, then uh, there's geology. You know, if you're really, really into how these uh, these minerals uh, form, then uh, looking for specimens where you can see uh, multiple instances or formation might be for you. Uh, this is a uh, a favored uh, German fluoride of mine. 
uh, wasn't again something I was initially looking for, but I saw this and I saw that uh, it had you know had that area of uh, greenish yellow growth. Then you had the purple grow over the top of that. A fine druzy of crystals came in later. In between, um, there was an event where the center dissolved out and formed a pocket inside, and you can see that dissolution uh, where it's dissolved on the bottom as well. And then yet another event, uh, event where that uh, that red hematite formed over the top. And uh, looking at uh, specimens where you can just literally see different layers of time in and uh, crystalline mineral just absolutely blows me away. It's one of my favorite things to collect. And uh, for me, the variety doesn't matter. Uh, if, if, it's a, if it's any kind of specimen whatsoever, but it shows uh, multiple growth areas or you know interesting geology, I'm, I'm right there for it. Here's another one, a nice little fluorite uh, from the Astro Pocket in Colorado. Uh, here you had a initial fluoride event, and then uh, more iron minerals formed over the top of that. Yet more fluoride grew after that. You got these nice little purple-colored corners and otherwise colorless fluoride. Just you know, just love sitting there thinking about you know all the different events that happened to uh, bring that final piece uh, to us. Uh, here we're looking at some uh, barite uh, from Poland. This is also fluorescent, uh, like uh, we saw earlier. And uh, you get that, uh, the way this one's been cut and polished, you can really see how that overgrowth of marcasite on the outside forms. So you have that more metallic mineral on the outside and uh, more kind of bubbly on the inside there. It's a really nice display piece. And uh, displaying brings us to jewelry because we like to display that as we wear it. Uh, so uh, jewelry is, uh, again, how I got started. Uh, for me, uh, jewelry is a uh, big, big part of my collection. Here we're looking at uh, a nice uh, coral necklace uh, that is a combination of carved and polished stones. And there are just several different ways you can add to your jewelry collection. Possibly one of the more easy ones to collect, especially if you're looking to wear. Uh, but you know, different brands, uh, custom pieces, estate jewelry, or just by the metals. Uh, what started for me uh, in jewelry was this top left piece here. Uh, this is uh, 1950s uh, silver from Tasco, Mexico, Antonio Pineda. Uh, it's very uh, distinctly hallmarked on the bottom, and I just knew that whoever made this uh, put a lot of love and time and care and artistry into the piece. And that is what got me started on uh, being a jewelry collector, and I've uh, been collecting uh, 50s, 60s, 70s Tasco Mexican silver ever since. Um, the bottom piece, my jaunty little whale there, is a nice little custom piece uh, that I'm still trying to find out who the artist was. Bought it from a, uh, a jewelry collector's estate and uh, did not have any information as to the artist. But again, great work that they did on this completely custom piece. Uh, you've got a big flat natural pearl, you know, a little whale eating the or chasing after the uh, the opal fish there. So me, I'm also a bit of a research junkie, so finding out who that artist there is actually going to be a big part of uh, the enjoyment of having that piece for me. Um, there's lots of brands out there. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of big brands out there. There's a lot of little brands out there. A lot of them are going to have a style or some sort of whimsy or just something that you enjoy uh, collecting. So, uh, you know, if you, find, uh, if you find a good designer out there, uh, definitely uh, take a look. And uh, you can start uh, building a really nice collection with uh, either multiple designers or uh, your favorite. Um, there's also a lot of really interesting older pieces. Uh, this is uh, a Jelly Belly. Uh, these were made by uh, Trafari, and these were relatively inexpensive pieces uh, years ago. Uh, I want to say 50s, 60s, 70s, around that time or period. Uh, it's basically uh, silver with a gold wash, rhinestones, and lucite plastic is what makes up the, uh, the body. Um, these were costume jewelry, very inexpensive when they first came out. Nowadays, you're looking at $500 to $1,000 just to get one of these little costume pieces. Uh, it was a very big lesson to me early on. When I was buying mixed lots of uh, you know real or uh, precious jewelry uh, mixed with uh, base metal costume pieces that some of the base metal costume pieces and actually significantly exceed the value of the, the uh, precious metal pieces. So uh, whenever you're out there collecting or going around to estates and things like that, you know, pay attention to designers. A lot of the times, if it's just base jewelry, 
uh, or base metal, but it still has a really good aesthetic to it, it might have a, uh, a value that significantly exceeds its material uh, value. Uh, custom pieces. Uh, here we have a completely hand-fabricated uh, pendant. We have a nice carved uh, tourmaline in the center, and then uh, these little uh, bars were all you know, rolled out uh, and then uh, by hand attached together to make that kind of jungle gym cage that it's hanging in. Um, if you're just not seeing what you like out there for jewelry, talk to your local jeweler and, uh, you know, come up with uh, and design a piece that's just right for you. Um, piece that, or the estate I got this one from, there were a lot of pieces like that. And uh, it's really fun. You can really see somebody's personality come out in these custom pieces uh, as, they, uh, as they go on. Uh, by era, here uh, I have, you know, several... Uh, uh, Pieces in my collection are, uh, you know, Victorian era, you know, those uh, those late uh, 1800s or Art Deco turn of the century. Uh, this is a late 1800s piece. Uh, it's uh, nine karat gold with uh, rose cut diamonds and uh, rubies. Um, so if there's just a particular time period that you're enamored with, you can uh, you can collect by era. Um, you know. When you're going out, uh, you know, I love stopping at estates or uh, antique stores that uh, sometimes feature uh, different estate collections. Um, there you can uh, find a wide variety of uh, pieces to wear and enjoy. And, of course, if you're, again, just you like metals, there are plenty of designs. Uh, the top right's one of my favorite, that, that hammered look. Uh, but you can get pure metals like in silver or gold with uh, really nice aesthetics uh, thereby. And of course, there's always new stuff coming out. Uh, you know, browse around, look and see what it is that you enjoy. You know, whatever you enjoy wearing, that's as much a part of your collection as anything that you decide to display. And of course, uh, you want to feature things that you uh, that you enjoy and love. So, uh, hope this has given you uh, some idea as to new places to take your collection or a place to start and uh, enjoy collecting. Wow, Christopher, that's so many wonderful things you shared with us. Um, and that piece right there, that looks like a fun piece. What is that you're holding? Uh, that is a uh, piece of agate from Brazil. Oh, fun. Yeah, I think I could I could see my own checklist just building as you gave suggestions. I can't imagine what the viewers um, added to their own list of what they want to do. Uh, now I know what you're doing as you're hunting around Tucson. Uh, I've seen you there always hunting for stuff, and we've had fun conversations there. Uh, oh, yeah. But now I get a bigger idea of what's all in your head as you're out there hunting along the aisles at the show. Yep. Um, I had a question from Lars Weha. Um, he, he, he loves the lecture, and he's a grad student in geology. Mm -hmm. And he asked if you could recommend a reference work or textbook for evaluating gemstones. Uh, for evaluating uh, gemstones, honestly, uh, the the GIA uh, is is one of my favorites. So, so the GIA has a, a whole grading system, uh, and uh, they really go into the the symmetry, uh, you know, grading the color, the intensity of color, the tone of the gem. Um, they're they're pretty much the standard uh, for uh, for grading the quality of gemstones. Well, perfect and. Um, I know that you were involved with the really impressive uh, gemology set, set um, at J JTV. Um, uh, uh, there was a, you guys donated some to our library here yeah, at Telus. The Cis Gemology Reference, yeah. Uh, the Cis Gemology Reference. Uh, I've actually got a little <laughs> since you since you happened to mention it there. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the Cis Gemology Reference here. Uh, it uh, goes into a little bit on uh, jewelry, gems, and minerals. Uh, Jerry Sisk was the author, and he, uh, you know, had a passion for, for all of it. And so the, the book is actually done in a way that it can be used uh, to identify gemstones or minerals. And, of course, there's uh, plenty of information or, you know, pictures of jewelry's, uh, jewelry in there as well. And it's a very visual guide. But you have all the properties for identifying gems and minerals and a really wide array of things to look at just so you can, you know, visually get familiar with them as well. Very good. I think I might have another couple questions coming sure. through, um, but I certainly look forward uh, as we wait for those questions to come through to me. Um, I I I want to see your collection. You talk about all that you have and how it's displayed. I think next time I'm in Knoxville, I'm going to have to make sure to to 
to, to make, have you show me your collection. Uh, I'm I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to get it out. I guess while we're while we're waiting on that one, I can show you uh, I can show you a couple of little things that I brought here. So there was uh, one that I was gonna show. Unless we've got that other question coming in here. Where is that? Like one of the one of my favorite little uh, parts of my gym collection lately has been if you could see this. Uh, getting uh, fire agates that have been cut in a way that they look like animals. So my little fire agate rabbit there. Oh, that's fun. Is uh, is a new one. Well, that actually is a great segue to the next question uh-huh. because um, Albert O'Ray actually asks about lately there's been these popular characters found in agates like the hooded owl and the new yeah. cookie monster. Um, he kind of wants to know how rare are they are these shapes, um, and um, and apparently you answered his question of if you collected character ag- agates. Yes, uh, they are quite rare. So this is actually a newer collection to me, and uh, Albert has got some some spectacular ones himself. Uh, he was he's one of the ones that really has kind of gotten me interested in this as well. Um, so from what I found, uh, you know, you, they do occur in in many different areas. Uh, the uh, Brazilian ones, I think, are the, you're, you're more likely to find face agates in Brazilian agates, from what I've seen, than uh, just about anywhere else. Uh, Mexican agates, uh, especially from uh, the uh, some of the regions down there, are uh, the condor agates and things like that. Um, so, and uh, down in the uh, Chihuahua area, it's it's actually a lot more uh, challenging to find some of the uh, the faces in Mexican agates, and then uh, the European agates as well have from what I've seen have been some of the most expensive ones and uh, some of uh, some of the more rare ones to find those spaces in. Okay. Um, and I have a question that goes back to um, the horse head inclusion. Um, mm-hmm. Kathy Horechka wants to know what it was that inclusion in that gym. Uh, it was just uh, internal fracturing. Oh, uh, wow. Nothing more than, than fractures and just the way uh, it had that golden color because of the way the light was reflecting off of it made it appear lighter than the surrounding material. If you turned the diamond just about 30 degrees and uh, uh, to the to the left, then that inclusion completely vanishes uh, because the light's not reflecting off of it in, in, in any way anymore. Wow, impressive. Yeah, and that's also one of the ones that uh, I wasn't really much of a collector at the point I saw that when it was about 2007. And uh, that is one of those that, to this day, I still kick myself for not having purchased that stuff. <laughs> uh, it sounds like there's a lot of things that you, you regret not catching, but it also looks like you've caught a lot of great things in your collection. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Christopher. Um, I hope everyone got to enjoy it. I think early on in the broadcast, we lost the Internet for a minute, and so there might be some initial material that was not um, – didn't make it onto there, but I, we got the bulk of an amazing presentation. And um, join us tomorrow as we continue. Now that we know what to collect, we're going to learn about how to take care of that and how to store and present our collections and maybe how to further our own goals with that collection. Thank you so much, Christopher. Hopefully, you join us tomorrow to hear Jose Santa Maria, the executive director here at TELUS. I'll be here. I'll definitely be here. Have a great day, and thank you, viewers.